everybody, and welcome to our Reunited Apart 2010 WSOP main event final table. Now, for those who don't know what this is, Google the Goonies Reunited Apart because that was a seller for me. Now, Chad, this was really, really your brainchild. So for for those who are, are getting with us now who don't know, tell us a little bit about, about your expectations for the day. Yeah, well, like you just mentioned, I watched the Goonies Reunited Apart, which basically meant like a cast reunion during these uh, COVID times, during the pandemic. They got together on Zoom, had a little reunion. I, I thought it was, it was great. You know, I love that movie. So I thought, how can we do something like that in the poker world? And uh, I consulted with you. We said, let's do it with a, a WSOP main event final table that was on ESPN at one point. So we kind of looked back at different years and we settled on 2010, largely because it's so special to us in that it was both of our first year uh, at the World Series of Poker with Poker News. And uh, so it just seemed only fitting, like, let's look back a decade, see if we can get some of these guys on and have ourselves a little reunion. Okay, so I'm just going to throw this out there. Yes, you know, it's all our personal experience or whatever. But yeah, 2010 for me, it was the first year I'd ever experience poker really in any way and I will never forget first of all just the getting to the final nine players because uh, it took forever like and I had no you know litmus with which to judge this but I remember it was like six o'clock in the morning and it was just like every time Brandon Steven would go all in double up all in it was just this massive kind of grind but my favorite memory and I want to know what your favorite memory from this whole thing is too. And it's not going to be Matt Affleck. Okay. Sorry, homie. That was like an epic one. But when we came for the November nine and it was like my first ever November nine, right in the Penn and Teller theater and people are, are lining up, you know, to, to get in and they did sort of like what they do for fights where each of the guys had a song and sort of came in with his, his jam and like his rail with him. And like, it was, I, rem I specifically remember Filippo Candio, Candio, I don't know, however Italians would say it, had this song, pop, pop, americano, do, 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 do. Like, I can remember the people's songs. One of them had Eminem's, you know, the, like, come out song. But it, it, for me, the hype was just so, it was really a show as compared to, I think, some of the other years. Some of the other years have been awesome, too. But what was your experience like? I think one of the highlights for me was during that period of the World Series of Poker, it seemed like we always had one big name making the final table, right? It was Phil Ivey one year. And this year in 2010, that big name was Michael the Grinder Mizraki. Mm -hmm. um, so to have him at the final table was really exciting. And then I always remember a big hand that he played against Matt Jarvis early on at the final table. It was a coin flip. It was ace queen of Mizraki versus the pocket nines of Jarvis and I can't wait I'm gonna talk to these guys about this hand hopefully and uh, they get it in and the flop comes queen eight queen so Ms. Rocky takes a huge lead with with uh, trip queens the turn though was a nine to give Jarvis nines full and uh, you know it wasn't over there because the river was the ace to give Ms. Rocky the queens full uh, and eliminate Jarvis and it's like just you can't those... write this shit. right That's crazy. this is yeah at the main event final table this is just a uh, you know, with so much equity on the line, that was just such a huge, huge hand. And, uh, you know, definitely sticks out to me from the 2010 WSOP. Well, also there's, and this is, of course, let's be real and, and be patient with me, because especially at this time, I was very new to poker. But nobody will ever forget the Joseph Chong mega super uber bluff. Like, what was it, Ace-4 maybe or something? Like, Ace-7? I can't remember, but he has uh, this, like... A seven against Queens of uh, Duhamel. Duhamel. With three, yeah, with three left. And uh, at that time, Raisner was short. So it was like this, uh, yeah, it was just this huge equity spot. And for, for me at the time, I just, you know, I just was like, what big balls? Like, this was amazing. Because really, you know, in a spot like that, it's like you, you know, you either play this event like you're going to play every other event or you play this event. And we've, we've seen, you know, no shade, but like with, Gordon Veo, for example, we've seen sometimes where people play extremely cautious and that's fine. That's their prerogative. That's their money. But when you see somebody getting in there and just going crazy and, and mixing it up with so much equity on the line, it's for me, it was one of the things that made me just love 
poker. I just was like, whoa, this is so cool. This is so cool. And I remember even when they were playing down and reading the blog and thinking John Dolan, I thought he was so sick. There were so many times where things had, he just played really, uh, just a really solid, solid game. Like, you know, aggressive, tight, aggressive, I guess, or, you know, was what we would say back in the day, but just all the players were so sick. And then I remember, so this has happened since then, I think with Greg Merson, but at the time the grinder had won the 50 K poker players championship or was that it? He won another bracelet that summer. So it was like still until the very end of the right. final November nine, we were sweating who was going to win player of the year. And this is, you know, happened again, I think since then, but at the time I just was thinking, wow, like it really, it was one of those years where you couldn't have written it in a more kind of exciting way. Tell, uh, to tell people a little bit how this is going to work, Sarah is, so we've re reached out to everybody. John Dolan did decline to participate. Um, I sent him a last minute, uh, you know, effort saying, Hey, we're doing this. If you want to get on, here's the link. I'm not hopeful, but the good news is others have decided to join us like here, the, the, the winner of the 2010 WSOP, Mr. Jonathan Duhamel. What's up? How are you doing, Sarah and I? We just uh, kicked things off, kind of we're recording and we're just going to talk to you guys as you come in and uh, you're the first one. Good. Sounds good. Always on time. <laughs> and also and, the most important one probably yeah, come on come on come on it's been a long time how are you guys doing well yeah i mean we're just kind of like everybody else living in this world with the pandemic uh, no world series of poker this would be about the time where i would be heading out to vegas for the world series of poker but yeah in, yeah same in, it sucks eh? yeah right and yeah. Uh, here comes another guy jason senti from he's all the way in malta right now hello Hey, what's guys? up jason hey how's it going we just uh kind of kicked things off here we're just waiting for people to uh to join in and uh yeah jonathan just got on you got on jonathan you're in canada i assume and jason you're in malta yep. right that's where home is I, now. yeah i'm in malta yeah it's uh it's much later here than it is where you guys are at i assume <laughs> that's a well, huge yeah, shift you used to be you were like a midwestern boy right I was, yeah. It's been a it's been a big change over the last, uh, I guess, four years since I've been in Malta. So yeah, I was in Minnesota for a long time. Well, it looks like we were just joined by one of our other guests, ESPN commentator for the World Series of Poker, Lon McCarron, is getting on. Lon, hey can you hear us? How you doing? Hey, Lon. I can. Lon. I can. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Everyone's got a beard. <laughs> Except for this guy. Oh, well, you just date a beard. Okay. And, uh, I no am the beard. beard. <laughs> <laughs> no beard. For, How's everybody doing? Uh, we're doing good, yeah. We're doing well. Norman Chad has uh, just got on as well. Oh, spice. Hey. The spice is about to end. Yay. Norman so, and I have talked three days in a row on the phone, and that is like an all-time high, by the way. So it's been a miserable week for you guys, obviously. <laughs> uh, okay, yes. so I feel like I feel like we should. So we're just kind of like letting everyone join in and chatting while we do, but we are actually recording. And Chad and I started. I feel like Lon and Norm, you could you could jump in here first with what we were talking about, which is so for Chad and I, 2010 was the first event where we really covered the WSOP main event. So maybe we're a little bit partial. Maybe this one was like super exciting or super fun for us. But Lon, give me your sense overall first of what the what was the 2010 main event experience like for you? Standard. Well, it was uh, it was typical until we get to the final table. Uh, even though we had done it on November nine for a couple of years, it's scary um for us in the broadcast world because we're we didn't have the luxury of being like on site really uh because we had so much work to do later on it was a quick i think it was a 24-hour turnaround on the broadcast for the final table and so for us uh it was kind of laying in, in wait for our producers and people to tell us which hands are going to be used what we're going to be doing uh wait in the hotel room for information coming to us and uh, and then starting a voiceover perhaps at three, four or five in the morning and trying to get it to ESPN on time and the panic of missing deadlines. So it was more about the television broadcast for me and, and fear of, of 
you know, missing deadlines and having to get it right uh, almost from the get go. So it was, I was scared. <laughs> Well, we just had somebody else join us. Yeah, you don't rec recognize him from the final table, but it was at the 2010 bubble, which was a pretty epic bubble. So we thought, hey, so yeah, let's get uh, Brandon Steven on this reunion as well. Kind enough to uh, join us. Brandon, how are, how are you doing? I'm doing real good. I don't know if I'll use the word epic, but uh, it might have been epic to others. It wasn't epic to me, but uh, it's good to see everybody. Good to see Jonathan with the beard. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, he's looking good. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi, Brandon. Hey, yeah, look at that. Hello, hey, Matt. How are you? I'm, I'm awesome. JD, I like, the, I like the beard That's you got good. going on. The hair looking solid. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, the hair is showing us all up. <laughs> no doubt. Um, no, I'll, I'll tell you, gentlemen, that uh, John Dolan did uh, decline to participate, so we're not expecting John to be on. Um, Soy Win, as I, I mentioned in the emails, has passed away since the uh, – November 9 in 2010. So he will not be with us, obviously. And uh, we're waiting on Ms. Rocky, Raisner, uh, Condio, and Joseph Chong. Joe did say he wanted to participate, but there was a chance that he might not be able to make it. Um, but we uh, will roll with uh, what we got right now, wait and see if those guys show up. Hey, I want to, Poker Blair says, I, might, I want to be there, but I might not. We know what that means. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like a gut shot at that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Racer and uh, Grinder are still at uh, Hard Rock Tampa playing poker from last oh, yeah. week. So I don't think they're going to make it. That makes 100% chance sense because I told Chad, I was like, you know, I, I, they both said they were into it. They wanted to do it. And then when I, you know, reached out with the confirmation reminder email yesterday, I didn't hear anything back. So I was like, well, I give it a uh, really terrible odds that those guys show up at this point. But it is Friday. We have to be honest. And it's before Memorial Day. So, okay, fine. I guess if they have to play. Football, I don't think I don't they know. ran deep anyway, Matt. So it's okay. Thanks. No chance. They're no out. chance. <laughs> Let's, so, uh, I want to ask real quick, since we've got you both here, we were just talking about the bubble hand. Um, it was like a six hour epic bubble before it kind of, it came down to a coin flip. It was uh, Brandon, Brandon, you getting your, your chips in with Ace King, Matt, you waking up with uh, pocket Queens, yeah. you know, what, what, what was the whole bubble situation like for, for you two? And then I guess for everybody else and it just being in a, such a long extended affair. Brandon, obviously you should start with this one because this was yeah, probably, probably the most the most yeah. intense for you. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's all been a blur. It's been so long, but I, I don't remember that hand as much. I remember I was so dead. I just looked down to Ace King and I felt like I had quads. Yeah. I really, I mean, it was like I had quads. There's no way I was going to lose. I, mean, I remember I got in a couple times before that and with really weak hands like, you know, Queen Jack or Queen Ten. And, I got Ace King. I was like, holy shit, I finally got something. And this is after hours. The only thing I mainly remember was going every two hours and then having a break with, yeah. with the 10 of us. I couldn't, I just remember the breaks more than I actually remember sitting down and folding and folding and folding. And then my buddy there, Jarvis, had to wake up with some queens, <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, what, man. What was, was it like for you, Matt? Were, were you sweating it at all? So um, I'm sure a lot of people had different different family members and friends and stuff like this either hang around or, or stick or stick there. But man, as it went, I don't think the that hand didn't happen until like 6:30 in the morning, and this is before they stopped things at like you know 2 a.m. or midnight or whatever they did. And I think I had like six or seven Red Bulls that day. Like it was it was just crazy. Just a, um, you know I was getting massages on breaks. Like it was just like you know whatever you could do. And then meanwhile Duhamel. Dolan and Joseph were just like, you know, pounding us. Um, yeah, it would have been a good spot yeah. to have a lot of chips at that point. But all of us, like, you know, five or six that were on that bottom bottom tier that were just kind of like hanging on, that felt like forever. Like we were just, in some ways, you're just hoping to get to the next break. You're just like, oh, I need another break because it just, every hand felt, you know, without Duhamel's stack, without Dolan's stack, like it just, yeah, it, it felt, uh, yeah, it felt forever. For me too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really was pretty miserable, right? Like, I was one who was, I mean, I went in as the short stack in the final table, of course, but I was in the middle of the pack for that whole stretch, right? And that's, you know, a lot of chipping down and then actually you uh, picking up extra chips in the last hand is what kind of, I think, catapulted me uh, right there. But yeah, that was, that was a, a horrible stretch because I think we played from like noon to midnight to go from 27 to 10. 
Yeah. And then it was midnight to 6.30 in the morning or something. And we're taking, I don't think I got back to my hotel room until like 8.30 or 9 a.m. And we had like media four hours later and stuff. And <laughs> it was, I just remember it was, that was uh, probably the least favorite poker I've ever played in my life. Just knowing that like, yeah, you know, it was just such a ridiculous ICM spot, uh, especially with the overlay of the November 9 at the time. I just couldn't do anything and just had to let our, our buddy John over there just kick my ass and everybody else as well. <laughs> it was pretty rough. <laughs> it was so much fun for me. I mean, I was just playing every <laughs> yeah. single hand. It was, it was the best. I could just, yeah. I, had, I think I had like 10 Red Bulls that day too, but I was just, <laughs> I'm going to play every single hand anyways. I was lucky I was chip leader at the time. Uh, for me, it was a perfect spot. I mean, uh, oh, on the last hand, I was, uh, I was cheering for Brandon because I, I was hoping this would go forever. I could just play every single <laughs> hand. It was perfect. That is true. Yeah, somebody that folded true. face up queens at some point, you know, pre flop wow. for like no no reason. So, uh, you know, it, for me, it was the best. It was oh, probably yeah. like one of the most fun playing <laughs> poker I've ever had. Yeah, I mean, those are the best possible moments or like the most fun moments in all tournaments anyway, right? When you have these ridiculous ICM spots and you get to be on the good side of it and you yeah, just get true. to play tons and tons of hands. And the fact that you had that on the biggest stage, uh, the most important tournament of the year, uh, for way too many hours while the rest of us were dead tired. That had to have been an amazing experience. Yeah, it was. It was for sure. And uh, for me, I wasn't tired at all. I mean, I could have played for like another 24 more hours. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it was the best. <laughs> Do you guys remember the hand that uh, that Dolan and Joseph played against each other? It was like a raise, three bet. It was like a raise, three bet, four bet. And then like Dolan sat there. I want to say he tanked for like 15 minutes before he finally jammed all in with, I think, Ace King. But he just, like, tanked and tanked forever. And it was just like an insta-fold for Joseph. But do you guys remember that, or am I the only one? I was I just it. talking about this with Chad beforehand, where I was like, yeah. Dolan is such a sicko and Chong. And, like, I was, for me, I was relatively, you know, new to poker. And then watching them play and, like, trying to understand, like, I was like, what is happening? They're both so crazy. This is crazy. Poker yeah. is amazing. Like, really, <laughs> they both were playing. They were so aggressive. And then, you know, coming at each other and and – yeah, I was just saying, like, I thought watching those two with each other was just bananas, totally bananas. It was Do we know what Joseph had there? Did you ever hear, Matt, about what he folded? I mean, he was, was he just re-raising with air trying to get the fold, you know? I think he was. I think he, was Joseph out of position or in position on Dolan? I can't remember. I think out of position. Uh, no, yeah, Joseph is in seat two and Dolan in three. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it was a raise, three bet, kind of like a small four bet where he kind of, like, it was putting Dolan to a spot where, look, you either got to go play for it all or, or you're folding this spot. You weren't really going to take a flop with, you know, the situation. And literally Dolan just sat there. And I just remember a look on his face. He just was like stone faced for literally 15 minutes. And I, yeah, it was just crazy. I, I want to ask not to rub salt in the wound, Brandon, but what is it like, what's the, the day like, the two days, the week after bubbling, you know, the, the November 9 at the time in the World Series of Poker? Or the 10 years after. <laughs> or the 10 years after. <laughs> the 10 years after is not as hard as it was the first couple of weeks. I mean, now I don't look back as it looked like I bubbled the final table. I'm more, I wanted Jonathan's spot. You know, I wanted to win the tournament. And still today, I want to win the tournament. So more now, I would say I'm more frustrated because I know how hard it is to get back there. Um, and now that I'm not going to keep trying, it's really the only tournament I play each year is that tournament that I, I still want to get back there. But in reality, then... I didn't realize how hard it was to get to that point until I, now I do. Um, the next week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we can probably go five, six months out. I was pretty salty. Um, I couldn't enjoy much. I was pretty upset. I went on a major poker tr uh, tear. I went out and played every tournament I could. So I had to get, had to get some sort of victory behind me just to feel better. But then it took a long time to get, to get unsalty, I'll say. Yeah, I got a lot of hate mail during that time as well, too. Uh, I don't know who that came from, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of my family, too. <laughs> now, Norm and Lon, this was during a time when the World Series of Poker wasn't live streamed like it is now. What was it like for you guys as commentators uh, as far as uh, you know, preparation or recording the episodes back in 2010 as kind of compared to today? <clears throat> yeah, I mentioned I was scared. Norman, how'd you feel? Well, uh, Lon mentioned earlier, and, and stories get enhanced as the years go by. He mentioned earlier that we were starting to, to voice that final table at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that is not true. We were starting to voice it early in the morning, 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Lon would likely be with a chambermaid at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, until <laughs> voiced. So it, it, was, it was unusual because, again, we on the final table, 
uh, we were sent to bed. You know, they started it late on purpose, uh, Las Vegas time, so that it would end in the middle of the night. And so the next day when it was shown on ESPN at night, very few people would know the result. So we, we left the final table so we could get to sleep uh, probably when it was seven-handed. And then we went to sleep, and then we would wake up and start voicing the thing uh, that Monday morning or Tuesday morning, whatever it was, it was going to air that night. And it was different. As Lon said, there's, it's, it's just a different spot for us. But it's, what's much more difficult was the production team. They usually, in, that, in those days, they would usually put together a taped presentation. It would take them several weeks to put together an hour. So they had to comp compact what they usually did over several weeks in 24 hours to make it look the same. So they were doing, you know, like ER work production-wise, and then they just roll us in to talk which is not that difficult, but uh, it's, it's a very unusual circumstance. It only happened those couple of years. And yeah, do but you they were slipping stuff something? under our hotel door at three in the morning. Do you prefer the way that they do it now? Do you feel more connected kind of to the stories and what's happening? Um, I like the way we did it a couple of years ago where we did it live uh, because you are um, connected. It, when we do the whole main event live though, um, which we do now, it can't be helped, but it does take us away from being on the floor because we've got to be in the announce booth. So for the whole time we're on the air, we can't be talking to players and, and walking the floor and handing out uh, stupid pieces of candy to people. But, um, you know, it, if we can do that and then do the posted shows the way they did them in the past, that would be my preferred way. They've gone with the budget and they've done the live show, and then they have started just cutting up the what we do live into one-hour chunks and putting it on the air with very little chance for us to change anything or uh, do the normal stuff we've been doing for you know 17 years. So um, I like that it's on live, but I would like to have fully posted shows as well to be able to you know create something as special as it's been for you know more than a you know, decade and a half. I'm curious to know from you guys who were a part of the final table, we had the November nine back then, which we don't any longer. Um, you know, what were your thoughts on the whole November nine concept and actually being a part of it and having to wait a couple months before playing out the final table? Well, for me, I thought first, I thought it was amazing, but uh, you know, we couldn't sleep for four months leading to that final table. So, you know, even though I think we showed up to that final table, super tired, uh, you know, especially for me, I, w I was super tired, but the adrenaline is so big, you know, because you anticipate that moment for four months. And so, you know, when you get to play that final table, it's, uh, you know, the feeling is even bigger, I think. Uh, so for me, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I wish they would still do it because uh, I think it's, you know, it builds up the show a little bit. But, it, you know, as player, it made something special playing it, you know, being in that big arena with the, I don't know how many people watching us, you know, live on stage and stuff. So it really was something made me feel like it was a, you know kind of a superstar the way you uh the uh, they showed us when we got into the place you know with the the ring girls and everything uh, i think bruce buffer was there too uh, announcing the the shuffle up and deal you know, so all those things uh, combined uh, really made it you know something special and you guys really had was. songs there was songs i told chad it was like cool. i remember like everyone came out to their own song and i was like this is crazy <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember that. There was a thread on 2 Plus 2 uh, talking about, like, you know, who should pick what song and all this kind of stuff back then. And uh, in NVG, it was it was a lot of fun. It was cool. We got to do that. Yeah. I thought the whole thing with the November 9 was great. I, I, I really, really enjoyed it. It was, we were really fortunate to be able to be a part of this at a time when poker was big and the November 9 was still relatively new and fresh. And it was this really cool thing that, you know, they were doing everything they could to, to really tell a story with uh, what we were doing, you know, let people get to know the players a little bit and, you know, build it up over, over time so that people connect to the, to the players and into the event and, and build hype. And I absolutely loved it. Uh, at, when we actually paused, you know, as a poker player who, uh, as we all thought at the table, I'm sure, who thought he, you know, was uh, one of the, who had an edge against at least some players, I kind of just wanted to keep playing you know, instead of necessarily have everybody take this time to go away and improve and all that. But it was a, it was a very, very worthy trade-off. It was a, it was a really, really cool thing and a fun experience. And for, for months to, I didn't quite do the tour like a lot of you guys. I didn't keep going to tournament stops and stuff as much as I uh, probably should have in between uh, the final table as well, <laughs> you know, from when we, uh, from the WSOP, the, the summer and the, the final table, but, uh, nor after either for that matter. But uh, it still was an amazing thing where we got to, yeah, 
get, get a fair amount of exposure and, and build hype. It was cool. What about yeah, you, Matt? I, I think, like, the four months off really gave people – like, it gave all this time to speculate that, that you know, who's going to win, who's going to get what coaching, who's going to, like – there's all this in between time for interviews and things like this. And, and, um, it really, it really set the stage that much more. Um, you know, not that I don't love the, the format now, I think, you know, in an ideal world, you'd play, I think it's only seven days now, not eight days, like the way we played it. Um, seven days, a day off, come back, play from nine to, to six. And I think that's maybe what you guys are doing it. Take another day off, play six down to three and then three down to a winner. Um, and I think we went, yeah, I was, out very early at the final table, but you know, from nine down to two yeah. is such a long time. That's like almost doing the whole bubble uh, that we played for, you know, 18 hours in a day over again. So I, I like that they've done that, but I still think, you know, if you could push it back, it doesn't have to be four months, but um, a little bit of time, it actually helps build the game of poker because it's just like, you know, there's so many storylines that can be created during that time that, you know, unless you're really following and you're an avid, you know, poker fan, you're not following the storylines quite as, as easily as you are when you have that, that, that break in period of time. It also made it unique. You know, it was the only tournament, you know, throughout the whole year that would, that would be doing this. So, you know, because it's the main event, you want something to be special. And so that was different from the other ones. So it really made it even more special because of that. So uh, it's very, very, uh, I think it was a really interesting thing. Uh, and I really wish it would be back because I think it's good. It's good for the promo, for the build up, for everything. And it, it makes it, you know, a little bit different from all the other tournaments throughout the year. Totally. Let's talk. Let's talk for a real quick minute uh, about Soy Win, who finished in ninth place in that tournament, the first to bust the final table, uh, courtesy of you, Jason. Does anybody have any fond memories or good stories uh, about Soy Win? Uh, personally, I didn't know him uh, really well, but the pretty much the only thing I remember is that all my crowd. All the people that came, you know, to watch in the stands were really mad when he busted because I heard the, there was a lot of, uh, you know, very looking people on his stand that everybody left. So <laughs> I remember everybody was sad about that. Uh, you know, the, the fun in the, in the crowd was a little bit uh, less than it was before, but that's about it for me. Yeah, Just I didn't know Soy particularly well, but uh, I, I will say he was – he was always a pleasure to be around. He was a very, very nice guy, uh, yeah. you know, really open and warm and having fun. And he was the first to, you know, he was, he was very humble about his game too, for a guy who had the success he did. He was just ridiculously humble about it and would always say that he's, you know, something along the lines of that. He's just, you know, he's, he's run really good and he plays mostly recreationally and he's fortunate to have all these, you know, very talented poker player friends who, who help him out. And yeah, he, I, I was a, I was a pretty big fan of size, even though I, I didn't actually know him all that well. You actually eliminated him from the final table. You had come into the final table as the short stack. And was there any sort of relief for yourself and I guess for the other guys too to not be the first one eliminated at the final table? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> there was a ton. Uh, for, it would have been easier for me to be eliminated first than anybody else for sure because I was such a short stack going in. Um, and so I spent four months being a short stack. Such a weird experience too. I talk about that, talk about the, the miserable for us, uh, six hours uh, in the bubble, not, not for John so much. Uh, but, you know, I played, it's the main event. It's a deep tournament. I remember having over a hundred big blinds, like the vast majority of the tournament and day eight, I went in, you know, top three in chips or something with 27. And then I spent four months as a guy with like 14 and a half big blinds or whatever it was I had. So it would have been fine, I guess, if I busted, you know, it would have been easier for me than anybody else. But I, I certainly would have been pretty upset to, to have, uh, have busted early on and, uh, I, I certainly exposed myself a bunch of times in the first few orbits. So I was, I was fortunate to, to win a flip against Soy and then get to play a little bit longer. Yeah, Jason, I really feel sorry for you. It's rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, everybody does, right? Boo-hoo. Yeah. It's just so horrible. You had to be a short stack. Yeah, bad for you. Did you watch it, Brandon? Did you, like, when it, when it came yeah, out of ESPN, were you like, okay, fine, I'm going to watch it? I was I went there and I was planning to watch out there. I left after about 15, 20 minutes. It was just slow and I just couldn't take it. To, uh, I wanted to get out of there really fast. So. But I feel bad. I still feel bad. I'm sitting there feeling really bad for Jason. That's four months being short stack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would have traded places, I assume. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we can see it's gotten a lot easier for you over these years. Huh? That wound hasn't closed exactly yet. Yeah. It was fine until Chad, uh, Chad emailed me or texted me about it. I don't know. How about this one? Right. Well, thanks, Chad. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I certainly appreciate you, you know, taking the time because I was a little nervous too, reaching out. You know, a lot of people don't want to talk about a, a negative experience and bubbling the November 9 is, is kind of that, even though it's a great accomplishment in itself. Uh, Brandon, I know you can't stay with us the, the whole time here. Uh, so let me ask you just one final kind of question is, you know, the 2010 WSOP as a whole, you know, what's your, your greatest memory about it or, um, you know, the, something, a positive thing that you took out of it other than, than finishing in 10th and, and missing out on the final table? Positive thing. It was, the atmosphere was amazing. Like, I'm, the thing that I think I remember most vivid was them taking the poker tables away each day. Yeah. And every day, like after I don't know, exactly. day five or six, they started taking tables away, taking tables away. And it was, that's when it really started to hit me like, oh my gosh. And they, when we got to 27, you know, like, like Jason, I had chips the whole time. And so they, the end of day seven sucked because it's like, okay, now one, one big hand changed so much. So I never was in that danger zone that I, that I am in often now in these tournaments. And so I was comfortable the whole time. So the biggest memory I have, I would say, is them taking tables away and the reality setting in that, wow, you know, I think when we got to 100 players, it's like, holy shit, I mean, now we're getting down to real numbers. And, you know, since then, it's like the day a bubble keeps following me. You know, I've had some big bubbles. I, I literally was the dead bubble on, on two million dollar tournaments, you know, two of the million dollar buy -ins. And those, you know, those suck too. So it's like this damn bubble keeps following me and following me. And uh, I don't know if it's gonna, I don't know if it's gonna keep following me, but I sure can't afford for it on the poker side to follow me for too much longer. Well, yeah, here's hoping that uh, the next time you find yourself in that spot that uh, the cards go your way because, like, it was, it was just a coin flip in this instance, ace-king uh, versus queen. So. I think, Jonathan, I think we talked about this. I don't remember, but you opened, and then I looked down to ace-king right to your left, and I jammed, obviously, but you had an ace with a three or seven, I think, right? Possible. I don't remember, but it's – I remember you, you would have called. <laughs> I was so sure that you were going to call and you would have hit your, your, your card. So I think even, even so Jarvis, I know you, I didn't send you the hate mail, one or two, but I think, I think if he didn't bust me, I think I would have been a casualty of Jonathan either way. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, your, your story about talking about the tables going away is spot on. I actually, in, in a lot of ways for me anyway, and maybe a little bit for Matt because our final table experience was so short. Um, the that final 27 day was almost more of an epic experience because yeah we're we're there for so long and the schedule was so stretched at that time they had all these days off and stuff so you're yeah. playing the main event for what felt like two weeks or something and then you had this one last day where yeah every day as you said tables go away and then the whole place is empty except where everybody's sitting and sweating the those three tables and you know that, that main area it was it was a lot of fun well, I want to ask about another big hand, Matt, uh, to you. I was going to ask you and the grinder, but the grinder has uh, stood us up here, unfortunately. But it was a big hand, one of my favorites from the final table. Uh, unfortunately, it was your bust-out hand, but it was a wild one um, when it was ace-queen versus pocket nines. Two queens come on the flop. You fill up on the turn when a nine spikes, and then the river is an ace. You know, what was it like to go through such a roller coaster hand? Yeah, I feel like that hand is kind of um, uh, there's so many people that still come up to me today and, and, and say that like, you know, oh, I still remember that hand that was like just crazy. And ultimately, it's, it's, it's a coin flip just like it was, you know, myself versus Brandon. Um, but the way that it came down is just absolutely nuts. Um, just like this up and down roller coaster emotions. Um, a couple things that I really remember. I remember being like very calm, even after seeing the queen queen, it can kind of um, if you go back and kind of see it, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it, it is what it is. It's, I'm, it was queen, queen eight. And I'm like, you know, okay, if a jack or a 10 comes now I can, you know, also have a gut shot as well too. I start thinking about things like this and, um, the nine comes and just, I'm so excited, fist pumping, you know, um, this Rocky still got a big smile on his face. He's like, oh, but he's got a big smile on his face and that river card comes an ace. The one thing I remember is like Chino Reem basically running out of the stands almost like pushing me over to get to jump on top of grinder. And I was like, Oh man, the other thing too, I said, I had a chair like held firmly in my hand, like ready to just like, you know, a lot of times since like since and before, if something happens like that, you're like, Oh, you know, toss a chair or get, get upset. And this, I'm like, you know, slowly release it and just, you know, yeah. But it's uh, it, it was such a fun hand, such a fun experience. Uh, I, I look back on the hand so many times and just, you know, the way it was called by 
by Norman Lawn as well too. Um, just yeah, it, yeah. Anyway, it was just it was just such an amazing experience. So, um, no, I wish I was on the other side of it for sure. And uh, you know, at some point, hopefully, I, I talked to Griner about paying for my therapy bills. But um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's I'm just joking. It's it's all good. It's amazing experience. I really think that I kind of kept a bit of a chip on my shoulder ever since that hand, um, just to really kind of uh, keep fighting back for more from it. So yeah. Hey, Chad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do as a, as a good bubble boy will do, and I'm going to leave early. Um, <laughs> but before I leave, you, know, you asked, I, I do, as I was sitting here, I'm looking at you guys, one memory that does stick out to me and when it's made reality really sit in, because I played with Affleck a lot at the table, and I thought to myself, this kid never makes a mistake. He's just so damn good. I'm like, he's never made a mistake when his bust out hand is the hand that sticks out to me. I wasn't at the table, but I was right next to it. And to see it and to, and to hear that, I guess that's what hit me the hardest was when I saw him bust and how hard he took it, I'm like, oh, shit, busting would really suck right now. I, know, I still receive hate mail about that hand. So it's been <laughs> going <out> 10 years. <laughs> yeah. That well, was Brent, a good hand. I mean, that was the championship hand. I mean, you look back on it. If he had those chips, he probably he would have done the same thing that, that Jonathan did at the final mm -hmm. table. So that was probably the, the deciding hand of the tournament. Mm -hmm. I yeah. yeah. Oh, appreciate you bringing that one up because it was classic. And uh, Brandon, thank you very much for for taking the time to to join us. I know you got a very busy schedule, so we certainly appreciate you uh, reminiscing with us. Good seeing all. I don't want to see any of you guys at the poker table again, but it's good seeing you on here. <laughs> yeah, it's good seeing you, Brandon. Thank you Here I am, bud. See you, Chad Norman. We'll see you. Bye. See you, boy. Jonathan, to piggyback off uh, that hand, I mean, you're the one who dealt out the pain in that hand. You know, what was what was it like uh, going through that hand against Matt Affleck, which really is probably the hand of the 2010 WSOP that's, uh, you know, the most popular one in the years since? Yeah, well, I don't know. It was just too much emotions, you know. Uh, you know, after the hand, I remember, I was just, in my head, I was like, what just happened? I didn't realize how big it was or anything like that. I was just trying to keep it cool, you know, but I was seeing, you know, Matt has such big mountain of chips and I was just seeing two TDs collecting all of them and slowly pushing that big mountain of chips towards me. And I was like, what's going on? Like, I, I, I don't even know, is this real? You know, and it, it, it was, it was a, a weird feeling for sure. You know, uh, when, when I saw his, when I called and I saw his hand, I was so mad at myself for, you know, putting myself into the spot. Uh, and I kept, you know, saying how idiot I was. And then you see that river card and this, and then it just would just happen. You know, it's, it's, it's completely crazy feeling and also seeing how he reacted to it. You know, he took it pretty hard, you know, with reason it's, it's, it was such a big hand, you know, in that spot with 15 players left. So, you know, I, it, I felt bad for the guy, but I gotta be honest, I was so happy, you know, just to see all those ships come in my way. Uh, you know, Matt's a super nice guy. So, uh, you know, it sucked for him, and, and, and yeah, I, I felt bad for him, but, man, I was so happy. And, and I kept looking at my crowd, and everybody was just, you know, laughing and, and being happy, and, uh, you know, uh, but I was trying to keep my cool. But it was tough, you know, to try to stay focused and to not smile and not show emotions when a big thing like that happened. Uh, you want to keep playing good after that. But in my head, I was just, you know, I don't know what just happened there, but this is it, you know, uh, I can win the tournament right now because of that hand that just happened. So I was just trying to focus on do what's right and win the tournament now. And uh, yeah, but I don't know, it was, it was a weird feeling. You can never imagine that's going to happen to you. And when it does happen, it's just what universe are we living in that this is happening. But it was a good feeling. It was nice, that's for sure. Uh, I want to... Go I was going to say, Matt Savage, do you guys, I think everyone knows Matt Savage here, right? <laughs> he, yeah. Every year at the LAPC, he shows this on the big screen. He puts it up. Uh, uh, I don't know if he still does it, but for years after, he put it up on the big screen just because he's good friends with uh, Matt Affleck as well, too. They, just to know. needle him? <laughs> just to needle him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's <laughs> incessant. He brings it up at every moment he can. And he, <laughs> so he has no crying in poker, and then he's always, yeah, waving the, the Affleck flag. <laughs> Love him even more now. Like that's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. He's relentless. I wanted to ask you, Jonathan, about another hand, which because for me, you know, I just was, I just loved all the bluffing, and you know, this was still the era of five bets, six bets, with you know, very little and air. And um, the hand that you played against, I mean, I think it was one of the 
at least second or third most pivotal hands of the of the tournament against um, Joseph Chong, where he I think is trying to bluff you maybe with a seven, or I, I, a something, a rag something it's like seven. this. Um, but this was like a really big moment in in the tournament, and I think kind of a tough spot for you. But I mean, knowing Joseph, it's like makes it an even tougher spot. Can you kind of talk us through a little bit about about that hand and that moment and being on this biggest stage with everyone cheering and going crazy? Yeah, well, the, the tournament was right, right there because the winner of that hand would have like, I don't know, 95% of the chips with uh, going heads up or something. So, um, yeah, that, that I, I was so hoping no ace, you know, on flop turn or river. But the way it happened, I think I think I was the one who raised on a button with queens and then he three bet and I four bet and he, well, I'm, I'm not sure where exactly it ended, but it was six or seven bets going in. But, uh, you know, when I put my last bet like my fifth, my fifth bet or something, I made it pretty small to give him some uh, room to, uh, you know, overshove with not much. Uh, but in my mind, I was hoping he would not do that because there was chances he would have aces and kings, but also there were chances he would have a hand like a seven and hit a ace, and so I would be out. So I was just hoping he would fold, and so we slowly grind the racer out so we can go and play heads up after that. Uh, but he decided to shove, and so in my mind, uh, as soon as he shoved, I knew I was going to call. Uh, my decision decision was already made, but I was not happy about it. So I took a second or two, and I called. And uh, just the look on his face when I called, he just, you know, it was, you're good, John. You got it. The, the relief, the relief was just so amazing. Like, all right, you don't have it. It was such a big relief. But then you see he has an ace, so you know, he still he still was live. I think he had 30 percent or something like that. So. I had, uh, had to dodge this, but uh, man, what a feeling again, because I knew he had a little bit more chips than I did. Uh, so he, he was still in after the hand, but you know, win that, win that hand and you win the tournament, that was pretty much it. Uh, and it is what happened. I remember when, when I won the hand, all my crowd just came into the, um, came around the table. Uh, man, I felt like I just won at that time. Uh, it, it was pretty crazy. I think that was even a bigger feeling than the the Mal Hafleck end because it was much closer to uh, to first place. So, oh man, what a feeling again! Those are probably the two biggest ends uh, of my life for sure. Uh, I've kept in touch with a lot of you guys over the years, but I know a lot of the viewers probably haven't. Um, can you you know each take a little turn and, and tell us? what life is like now and how it's changed since 2010. I know a lot of you have started families and, uh, you know, started businesses and such. Give us just a, a quick update on, on what's going on. Casey, you want to go first? All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess uh, <laughs> after the, uh, so I played poker professionally for about nine years. So I started in uh, 2007 um, after uh, being an engineer for uh, electrical engineer, software engineer. For a few years and uh, after the final table I continued uh, playing uh, poker professionally till 2016 and at that point I moved to Malta uh, where I am now and it's late at night uh, for the to uh, help start run at once poker with uh, Phil Galfon, Phil Galfon's poker site. So I've been here uh, working on that for the last three and a half coming up on four years and my uh, in terms of personal stuff, my wife and I had actually been trying to have kids um, since just within like a year or two after the final table. I uh, didn't get anywhere with that uh, until um, right after we quit trying and moved to Malta. We thought we would, okay, we're going to take this uh, kind of adventure, uh, take a shot with this poker site, um, move to Europe, you know, uproot from uh, the Midwest. And then a month later, we were pregnant. And so now we have a, a wonderful two and a half year old daughter and uh, living in Malta, grinding the, on the other side of the industry with, uh, with Runner Once Poker. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's great. You know, if, I know, if you want to have more kids, Jason, though, I can just tell you from personal experience, if you put up some wall hangings, uh, it really sets a better mood. Uh, and I yeah. think uh, you got a better chance of uh, conceiving a second, maybe even a third time. <laughs> I'll take you up on that. Thanks. <laughs> How about you, Matt? Uh, what's life like for you? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I kind of talked about having the chip on my shoulder right after, uh, right after the 2010 final table. Um, I actually knocked out Grinder at the very last hand of day one the next year to go on to win the 5K6 max bracelet, so that felt pretty good. Um, you know, a little redemption. Not quite the same, but, uh, but it felt a little bit redemption uh, against, him, against him there. Um, 
really kind of kept playing poker a little bit, but jumped into a few different businesses, got married in uh, 2013, um, bought a house, which was great, had a baby girl, uh, Mila, uh, the beginning of 2018, who's just been, um, you know, I just love that girl so much. Just, uh, yeah, just, Sarah, I know you just had a baby as well too, baby girl as well too, congratulations. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been, uh, it's been amazing. I've kind of, I've kind of tried out a few different businesses. Um, right around the time she was born though, I, I felt like I really hadn't found my passion. Um, so I, I really wanted to be in something in, in tech though, something that could, that I could build, that could scale, that like could, you know, many different people could, could, um, enjoy and, and, uh, and, um, engage with. Uh, so you know, I, I had an idea to build like a live streaming poker and eventually social casino platform. Um, and uh, yeah, we were selected as one of the um, 10 companies to be part of Snapchat's accelerator this past summer. So I spent the whole summer working with uh, alongside Snapchat, basically had like a half an hour conversation with the co-founder of Snapchat, Evan Spiegel, um, met guys like Gary V, co-founder of Twitch, like just, um, it's been this really cool experience to kind of meet these, you know, heavy hitters in the, in the, the tech world. Um, and yeah, we're, we're building something that I think, uh, the poker community is going to love. It's, it's quick, it's fun. It's designed for mobile. And, um, Kevin Martin, uh, one of the top, uh, poker Twitch streamers is our, uh, is our host. So yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. I'm, I'm excited for people to try it out. Hey Matt, thanks I have for the commercial. Uh, I'm just curious about the, uh, the, uh, you know, I know you, you wore a funny pair of sunglasses, but I can't really recall what they look like. Do you have anything that could remind me what those sunglasses look like maybe? I don't, I don't know. It, <laughs> nice. Kept them close by. I thought they might come in handy for this. <laughs> Jason, you, you, you wore a, a little, um, a visor type of hat at, uh, you got one to pull out here? Put no, I don't. I never, I've never uh, worn a visor in my life. I don't think. I was, well, maybe I maybe a couple times, but I, I rarely wore baseball caps, but had to for it to be patched up. And that's what my wife got. She said, you know, wear this instead. So that was that. I, I do remember seeing, I didn't watch much of the broadcasts um, for our year. I watched tons and tons of World Series of Poker, but I, I didn't really watch ours at all. But I do remember getting some needles from Norman for that, for the, for the visor and the sunglasses. <laughs> And how about you, Jonathan? I know you're a family man these days as well. Yeah, family man. I got uh, two kids now. I have a daughter who's uh, four years old and a little boy who's uh, two and a half years old. So it's pretty much what I've been doing the last four years. Uh, you know, after winning the main in 2010, I just went on a run and played every single tournament on the planet. Uh, obviously, I had a pretty good deal with Stars, so they wanted me to be everywhere, which I did. And so I thought it was a, you know, amazing. Uh, you know, uh, amazing uh, uh, experience for a couple of years, that's for sure. Uh, but eventually I decided to settle down a little bit. You know, it's a lot of fun, but uh, you know, you're never home. So I was missing my friends, missing my family, uh, missing Montreal and stuff like that. And so I settled down a little bit. And so we had, a, I kind of stopped playing a little bit when we had a, our first daughter, uh, first kid. Um, so right now I'm not, I'm not playing much, not traveling much, uh, just staying home, having a lot of fun, uh, raising those two kids, playing outside and, you know, just, just having fun. You know, I felt like for a lot of years, I, I've, I've been, you know, everywhere and playing and, and not doing much for myself. So this is just good. I'm just taking the time and taking it slow and being by the pool and not doing much. And, uh, it's amazing for now. I'm really, really enjoying, uh, you know, this new life. It's very different from from being everywhere. I remember being in Europe and in Vegas, in the U.S. and Australia, just playing every single every single time. Just being on planes, I remember I keep saying that the airport was my my real home because it's pretty much I was sleeping there. I was there all the time. But uh, it's good to uh, take things a little bit slower and just you know enjoying enjoying life, having some fun. Uh, we might have a third kid at some point. I'm not sure, but. Uh, you know, this is it for now, and I might be back uh, at some point. When I think when the kids are going to be a little bit older, I'm going to restart traveling a little more. But for now, I'm just enjoying life in Montreal. Sure. Well, I got a final question for each of you. The World Series of Poker here in 2020 
has been postponed, you know, given the pandemic. Now, you know, silver lining is it gives people time to, to do things like this, where we can get together and have a, you know, reunion online. But on the flip side, you know, this is about the time of the year where we would have all been heading out to Vegas. And so I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on, uh, you know, the WSOP not taking place this summer and maybe what you'll, you know, be up to. And let's start with Norm because, I mean, that would be your job. You know, part of you, you and Lon, we're, we're going to be uh, the voice of the WSOP again. But uh, now, now you've got a summer off. Yeah, and it's hard to replicate the, the smells and the sounds of the main bathroom at the rear. Uh, and I, that's what I'll miss the most. Uh, people tell me bad beat stories uh, at Urinal 4. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's a, obviously unfortunate we're going to not have it. Uh, there's plans, hopefully, to have some portion of the World Series uh, in October or November. And I have a feeling that it will have a higher online element to it. But yeah, you miss, you know, Lon and I have been doing it since 03 and, and, and then in 04 is when we did more than just the, the, the main event and did other stuff. So it's just, it's every summer for us for 15 years and it just becomes part of our life and I'm used to it and uh, I love it when I'm there and I miss it when I'm not there. So it's, it's kind of unusual as it is for all the poker players who regard it as a summer camp not to show up this summer and there'll be some shortened version of it, I hope. Uh, sometime in the fall, and uh, we'll be able to resume normally next year if, if, if all is great. How about you, Lon? What, uh, what are you going to do with your, your summer off, your summer free time now? Well, what I've been doing the last couple of months, you know, uh, I'm being a good boy, honkering down here in Northern California, um, trying to stay put, uh, keep in touch with my, my kids, uh, both married and and uh, my son lives in Southern California, my daughter in New Orleans. And so we get together and have a game night on, on Zoom and, and do that. And uh, just, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do around the house when you have to. So I've actually read a book, uh, Brewing Beer. I made beef jerky. I made mustard. I re-got the, re took new life to the garden that I have here. Uh, I've got extra dogs around for a while. The neighbors bring their dogs around. So yeah, nothing. How's that? Nothing. <laughs> Where's poker? And for you guys that uh, normally would be playing the World Series of Poker, are you going to miss it? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of taken a, a bunch of years off. Uh, 2015 was last year. I kind of went like really hard. Um, had a deep run in the main, finished 51st. So it was like seeing those tables kind of collapse down again was like a really cool experience. Um, but I, I have, I've missed playing it since. Like I've really like wanted to go back there and play it, but uh, just been, been busy with a few other things. I was hoping to get that back there this year. I was going to try and do some promotion with my um, new Cash Live app and, and uh, try and, you know, pair that with playing the main event and a few different things. But um, darn it. Yeah, it's getting pushed back. Hopefully we can still do it in October, November. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it seems like it's, you know, I would even doubt, you know, po with poker chips, like changing around from hands to hands and just everything that goes along with being so close to people. Like you see some of these designs that come out with the glass, you know, dividers and stuff. And you're just like, Oh yeah, I, <laughs> that's not poker to me. But, um, uh, yeah, at the same time, online poker is just like taking a huge boom. So it is cool. Like both actual poker players and non poker players, like I'm playing in a, like a little house league with, you know, $60 sit and goes and stuff like this with some friends on, and we, we play on zoom at the same time too. And I, in some ways, I think this, these times have really like, you know, given a huge boost to the poker industry. Like people can't jump and play beer leagues uh, for, for basketball or hockey or things like this. Um, people want to compete, especially, you know, a lot of us that are, are right now kind of stuck at home. So this online poker has been like a great outlet for, uh, I, I personally haven't done it in years, but it's, it's been a nice outlet to kind of like get back into it, compete with friends and, and have fun at the same time while not uh, maintaining the social distance. So, yeah. And Jason, yeah. I know you're, you're keeping us busy with online poker with run at once in the Gelfon challenge. Yeah, we're doing our best. That's for sure. So <laughs> that's, you know, uh, as far as it goes for me, I haven't been to the world series since 2016 uh i really thought i'd always play the main event you know it, for probably the rest of my life but uh it just didn't work out that way i've been so uh dedicated to the what we've been building it run at once and getting over there from malta especially we only go back once a year anyway to to be able to to see family and stuff so to to take that time away from working on this just hasn't made sense to date um but yeah so there there's not a huge difference there for me this summer um it's a big difference to be working from home uh, but my my focus is is very much on uh, working on run once poker. We're 
you know, it's obviously a, the whole situation's just brutal for, for everybody and for a million reasons. But if there's any silver lining for us, it's, uh, you know, as people who've been passionate about online poker for a long time is that, you know, there is a little bit of a, a another renaissance here for online poker and that a lot of people are finding that again. Uh, and so for, for me, that's, that's what I'm focused on is, is, is building that. And uh, it'd be nice if we could be in the office. It was uh, watching the Gelfond challenge was a lot more fun in the office when we had everybody gathered around. Cause for us, it's at the end of the day. Um, I know for you guys, it's if you watch it at all, it's, it's early in the day, but that, that was fun to gather around the projector and stuff, but uh, we can all do that stuff from home. So. Let's uh, give Jonathan as the winner of the 2010 WSOP, you know, giving you the last word, I think seems appropriate. Um, you know, just the whole 2010 WSOP experience obviously means a lot to you. Do you look forward to one day um, sharing that with your, with your kids and maybe letting them watch, uh, you know, old episodes of, of the ESPN broadcasts? That I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure to be honest. Uh, as much as you, you know, I want them to do whatever they want with their lives and stuff like that. I'm not sure I want them to gamble that much. So we'll see. I have no clue to be honest. Uh, if they want to see me play, if they want to see the old footage, I'll show them. If they want to learn how to play, I'll show them how to play. I'll, I'll teach them some strategies and stuff. But uh, I'm not going to be pushing for that. That's for sure. I want to let them do whatever they want, and uh, we'll see after that. Um, no, I mean, I just, I just want to have fun. I want them to have fun. Uh, nothing too complicated. Just enjoy life. Have some fun. You know, life is good. So we got to be happy. We got to enjoy it. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it.